Well, welcome everybody on this Sunday at the, is this the start or the end of daylight savings? I never remember. Start. This is the beginning of daylight savings. Well, you take the class. And that's why we're all a little tired, because we lost an hour there. Um, anyway, my name is Elena Loomis. I'm the chair of the Monterey County Democrats, and I'm really happy to welcome you here, and also to acknowledge the help that Labor gave us by providing us with a hall to be in, and yeah, several labor folks are here, so we're really happy to have you. So I thought that um, it's we're a relatively small group that we could introduce ourselves. So Rusty has an idea of where we're coming from, who he's speaking to, and um, and then I'll introduce Rusty, and he will talk for a bit, and then take questions, and then mingle afterwards. We've got some food. Uh, the restroom is right back there. If you have need anything, or if you want to go grab some food right away, please do so. So I'm going to demonstrate. That's, I was a teacher before, so i <laughs> demo what it is you want folks to do. So we're going to do a quick introduction so that it doesn't take a um, super long time that we still get an idea. So your idea would be your name, your role, and one thing you're thinking about doing for in this election cycle. So I will demonstrate my name is Elaine Lewis. My role is chair of the Monterey County Democrats, and my uh, what will I do for the election is uh, register voters. So, can I ask Karen? I'm Karen Rogers. I'm yeah. vice chair uh, representing Assembly District 30 for the Monterey County Democrats. I also am on staff across the aisle there at the uh, Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. What I will do this election season is continue to work to build bridges with folks with whom we have shared values. Beautiful. Hello, my name is Teddy Cavaldez. Um, you can hear the local people from the union. And uh, I will support all the local people. Great. Great. I'm um, Gary Carnes. I'm vice chair of uh, uh, Karen. Um, so what I think I want to do to despite defeat Donald Trump is to meet all the little mini Trumps to beat all them is to build our capacity as a Democratic Party in this county. Great. Um, my name is Will Freeman. I, I'm a former trustee at Harlem College um, here at Salinas. I'm a cancer survivor, and uh, I, uh, I will go anywhere, um, help, help any friend, find any foe to defeat this bozo of the White House in November, <laughs> because our country cannot afford another four years of this idiot in the White House. And we're going to beat him. We're going to beat him from one shining sea to another. We're going to beat him from north to south to east to west. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Ask Michelle and then you will. Oh, we'll, we'll work our way back up. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Nanico, and I'm the assistant to the chair. Oh, and what was the last question? Oh, what are you going to do to uh, help in this election cycle? Just try to keep up with Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure he has a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, my name is Ella McCarter, and I I will be voting to be the Trump. <coughs> my name is Frank Quigley, and I'm the president for the California Retiree Group, Chapter 36, which is the Monterey Bay Area Group, and I will do anything to be Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm Bob Cobo, I'm a retired teacher. Uh, I think I had tenure in the Labor Council here. Uh, I was formerly president of the Monterey County Labor Council back when I was president of the North Monterey County Federation of Teachers, AFTO. And my big goal is, as Bill said and others have said, get rid of Trump. And while I have a lot of respect for the Democrats, I'm worried about the ones who are so committed that if Bernie doesn't get the nomination, a lot of them are saying, as some did before, that they just won't vote or they'll vote third party. And so my goal will be if Bernie doesn't get it, and I think Bernie has a very good chance of getting it, in which case I will support him completely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mike. I work with uh, Monterey Soon Left, and I'll write letters or phone call or raise money. Great. 
also this thing left um, with it since 2017, since March of 2017. So we've got pretty group here in Monterey Peninsula. We're writing letters, we're canvassing, we hope to do some fundraising, keeping our resources involved, and, and the Democrats up and down. It's great. I'm Jan Schreiner. I work with kids in Santa Clara County with SCIA 521, where we just barely negotiated successfully a tentative agreement. Uh, we've been working on it since June. I also live in Marina, so I'm a member of the Marina Coast Water District Board. Vice President, it's my 10th year uh, trying to maintain publicly owned water next to a rather large corporation that has their ideas on us. And for the next election, I have been a Bernicrat, and I um, will encourage my fellow Bernicrats to make sure to vote for whoever is the then uh, nominee. And then I'll be canvassing for local um, progressive candidates. Not a stick for now. For now. My name is and I am the artistic director and founder of Spectre Dance. And I create socially engaged art. I've been doing that for over 20 years. And for the election, I am looking for where I can be most useful. So I am here. <laughs> Great. Yay. Great. Hi, my name is David Tom. I'm one of the California School Boys Association. I'm also uh, the, the Rutherford Officer for the Monday Night Central Center for the Democrat Central Committee. And, uh, Oh, I'm also a like, school board member uh, for the for the, the Beanfield the Elementary School District. Uh, and education is very important to me, and I believe whoever the candidate, uh, whoever from the Democrats, they all believe in uh, education. And my contribution will be continue to register people in South Bryan County. There's very few, there's very few opportunities for them to do that. So whenever there's this opportunity, I try to have a booth to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. And what will I do for November is support the nominee, whoever he is. It's not late enough, it isn't he or she. Um, he is, and, uh, and, and try and support local candidates that share our labor um, democratic values, about making sure that working families uh, have a place in Monterey County and that the rights of respect. Hector Aspicueta, Secretary Treasurer of the United Local Community. <coughs> and what we're going to be doing this year, my first mate, I'm going to be voting. Uh, and second, we're going to continue to uh, post uh, four banks in our office to make sure that we are like the right people to the rest of us. My name is Eric Quigley, I'm a retired electrician. Um, so, so far I've donated a little bit of money to both the Germany <coughs> and Kamala Harris campaign. We went up to the uh, Bernie rally and Sounds like there were a lot of people there, and it was really great. Um, we'll see how it goes. Whichever candidate they get on the Dem side, I'm for it. I'm also really hopeful that the down ballot will, well, the blue wave will sweep in the down ballot. Plus that the, um, plus that also with the census, it might change this next, um, next um, decade to skew it a different way than it was skewed in the last decade. So I'm really hopeful that, yeah, it's bad right now, but. Two steps forward, one step back, I think things are going to be okay. Uh, Dominic Durston, I'm on the executive board for uh, 8030. Imagine how many fit in the doors during the election. Great. Uh, Jenny McAdams, I'm on City Council for Pacific Road, and um, I will continue to encourage um, women and working moms to vote and be active and run for office. Uh, yes, my name is Maria Lisa Alejo. Very well, Mr. Yes. Summer to this man. Uh, but I still go by Alejo, so you probably see my, my father is still Alejo because I have six wonderful kids on Alejo, so I have kept my name because of my voice, you know, Alejo, and I feel like I'm not part of it, I gotta be part of it. But I'm married to this man here, which is a wonderful husband. I am a retired Richard registered nurse. I used to be a steward for the union. And the nurses in Santa Cruz County Jail, that's how I started. I've been a Democrat of my life. I never did much because all, my nurses were always so busy. They worked double shift. But then when I retired, I decided to uh, come in and to uh, help the Democrats win. 
And I'm uh, right now the president of uh, representing District 2. We are a member of the uh, Monterey Democrats uh, County Central Committee. And I plan to continue being there. And uh, I'm a supporter of Marty at this time because I believe that he has all the, all the qualifications to help all of us, not only part of us, but all of us. You know, he's a voice for the people. He's been in the civil rights movement for a long time. And he's been in justice candidate for a long time. And right now we need somebody strong to get there and kick the butt out of uh, Trump out of there. I also represent, I'm a president, president of the Salina Valley Democrat Club, which I'm proud to. I'm hoping that more people will join in. And I'm gonna do my best so that we can win because we need to really kick Trump out of there. Thank you. The theme continues. <laughs> Okay. I'm Sandra Martinez, by profession I'm a nurse, I'm an AD30 um, delegate and I'm the Vice President of the Monterey County Labor Council. I'm very motivated for this election, um, of course I'm a Bernie supporter, however that's not relevant right now, what I'm focusing on is the down ballots, because even though we have a strong Democratic presence, there is some areas where people will vote for Republican light, that is not a true Democrat, and so that is where I focus, I think, it impacts our everyday life, and that is um, what I really want to do, and it's, especially I'm from South County, and rural areas usually don't get a lot of the energy, and that is our focus. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Al Martinez, I'm Sandra's husband. Hey, I gotta turn after all. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my name's uh, Wes White, uh, Salinas resident, um, recent elected to the Central Committee. Uh, homeless is a big issue for me, so I guess that's probably what I'll try to do is uh, register homeless people to vote, especially down ballot, especially local. Great, thank you, Wes. And Dred, we missed you. My name's Dred, we call a cameraman. Uh, about all this, about following the right, I feel it, so here I am. Yeah. 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 So, we're really excited that Rusty Hicks, the chair of our California State Democratic uh, Committee, is here with us. And uh, he is a labor, he comes from labor, so he totally understands the working class and how important it is to support our labor folks as well as the rest of us. And we just want to welcome him and let him know that we're willing and able to help, whether it's on our local campaigns. Obviously, you can see that we have an interest in the presidential campaign. Uh, and we're also eager to find out how we can maybe reach up to other counties that might not be as blue as we are. Um, so, Rusty, next. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, I think we should give our chair a big round of applause. For her. Uh, and certainly, uh, Cesar, your, your great work. I know how hard being a county chair is, uh, at least in my current role, and being the head of the central labor body really is. So, I'm grateful for your work and for your leadership. Uh, it, it's great to be with all of you. It's great to be in a union hall. Uh, I have said a couple times that, in many ways, it's ironic. Uh, that I have the honor and privilege uh, to be the chair of the California Democratic Party, but also to have led one of the labor councils in our in our great state. Because being from Texas, uh, no one in my family ever was or is in a union, so no one carried a union card, and no one ever was or is a Democrat. So you can understand how complicated my Thanksgiving dinners have been year after year after year. Um, but I do think I share that with you because I think it gives me an appreciation uh, for how the other half lives. Uh, and the reality is, is that those that aren't Democrats or those that don't have the opportunity to be Democrats or aren't enlightened at this particular moment, ultimately kind of want the same things. Uh, 
Uh, they want a decent job that they can provide for themselves and their families. They want to see a doctor when they're sick. They uh, want, want to be able to retire with a little bit of peace. They want to get a good education for their kids. They want to have clean air, clean water, be safe in their communities. All the things that we, um, uh, that we all want. Uh, and so when I talk about our work as the, as the party, as Democrats, I think our job is not solely just to come to meetings and talk to ourselves about how we improve the lives of Democrats. It's our job to really harness the power of 9 million Democrats in California to improve the lives of 40 million Californians. Uh, I believe that premise that we will all do better when we all do better. And just because you happen to be misguided in your political persuasion at the moment does not mean that we're not fighting for you too, right? Uh, so, so this morning I, I really just want to touch on three quick things and really then get to your questions and get your feedback. Uh, I committed um, during the campaign, uh, I went to all 58 counties, I did it in 58 days. I would not recommend that being the way to actually see the state and get, a, get an appreciation for just how big this state really is. Uh, but somewhere along the way I bumped my head and committed to going to every county every year that I was chair. Uh, so I, I uh, sort of take weekends and try to do three, four, five of them in a weekend to have conversations with folks to understand what's really going on on the ground. And I can tell you that every county is different in its feel, in its real concerns, in its issues. But ultimately, I think there's great activism happening all, all over the state, <coughs> not just in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Sacramento. It's happening in virtually every part of the state. So I want to commend you for the great work that, you, that you've already done, and thank you for the work that you're, you're going to do. Uh, but this morning, I really want to give you a sense of there's been three major things I've focused on in the last uh, nine months. One has been uh, to, to clean up a bit of a mess. Uh, and some of you have some sense of what that's been about. Two is to turn to the work uh, to get us focused for, for 2020 and beyond. And third is to find a way to pay for it. Uh, the reality is these campaigns cost a little bit of money and you got to find a way to fill up the tin can uh, in order to do the, do the work. Uh, some of this information some of you probably already know. Uh, and so I, I ask that you just bear with me because I want to make sure we all have some of the same uh, pieces of information. So the first step has been to do a little of the cleanup, uh, primarily focused on the reason why we had a chair's race to begin with. Uh, obviously we had a chair who resigned uh, under a cloud of misconduct and, and harassment. Uh, and so I walked in, having started before I was elected, to be prepared to put a system in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Not that you can say misconduct will never happen again, but if an individual becomes a target of misconduct and harassment, there should be a very clear place where they can go and lodge that complaint, and they know it's going to be dealt with efficiently, effectively. And it puts in place a culture that says this kind of activity is unacceptable. Full stop, period. Um, and so we put in place a new code of conduct that made it clear as to what the rules of the road were going to be. Um, two was to appoint an independent ombudsperson that was a third party that would be the central point of contact for any complaints. Uh, third, we had approved a list of independent investigators. So the ombudsperson would say a complaint came in, it needs to be investigated, I'm going to go to this list of investigators and select an investigator to review this complaint. And last is when a complaint had been substantiated, found to be true, that it would go to a conduct commission, five members outside the formal structure of the party, to basically provide a recommendation to the officers as to what discipline should be uh, enacted. And then it's on the officers to enact. Uh, that, that discipline as the elected body of the, of the party. Um, so it's a fairly um, complex um, and certainly a, a thorough, robust system. Um, and it's been in place for three, four months or so. We've got a couple of complaints that have already come in and went through the process and discipline has already been enacted. Um, so it is working and we will continue to make it better over time. 
Uh, but the second piece of that was actually to do right by those who were wrong. When I walked in the door, there were uh, eight individuals that had filed a total of five lawsuits against the state party. Uh, and the position when I walked in was essentially that these issues needed to see the light of day in the courtroom uh, and that we were going to fight these allegations to the, to the bitter, bitter end. I felt that that was not good for those individuals. It was not good for the party. It was not good for any of us. Uh, so over the last six months, I initiated mediation talks with all eight plaintiffs. Uh, and at the beginning of the year, we formally announced that we had settled all five uh, lawsuits. Uh, it's, you, can, you can Google the LA Times and the Wall Street Journal and it will tell you uh, just what we ended up having to pay um, in, in settlements. But it's in the multiple seven figures. Um, that is money that could have gone into the work of the party. Um, but I think it uh, was important that we do right by those individuals and that we move our party forward. Um, and um, it's an expensive lesson for the party uh, that you can't just um, not address these issues in a very real way. So that was one. Two was the finances of the party. In 2018, there was uh, $42 million that actually flowed through the party. And yet the books of the party had not been audited uh, for more than 10 years. Now, everything is public. Uh, campaign finance requires that all of our information is public. Um, but I thought it was important just for a third party to come in and look at our financial structures. You know, we're in a, you know, there's a lot of union backgrounds in the room, and you know that having oversight and accountability on your finances is particularly important. It's not our money, it's not the union's money, uh, it's the member's money, right? Uh, and so I initiated an audit for 2017, 2018, and have initiated a, an, an audit for 2019. I've committed to doing that every year that I'm, that I'm chair. Uh, the second was there wasn't even a, a budget that had been passed uh, and approved by the finance committee of the party. Um, I believe in some level of oversight uh, and put forward a uh, a budget for the uh, for all of 2020 and had that approved by our finance committee. I, I share with you some of these sort of boring and maybe mundane details because I think they're particularly important because if we're going to do big stuff, you've got to have a solid foundation from which to do that. Uh, and so these are the kinds of structural things that need to be done in, from an organizational management standpoint in order to allow us to do the important work. Because the reality is, is that as we turn from the cleanup to the work, um, you know, the big fight is, we're going to have a big fight in 2020, but our big fight is in 2022. Um, as mentioned, we talked about the census, right? We talked about the census. Um, there's a potential for us to get, have an undercount which means a lack of real dollars into our communities, but it also means that our district lines get redrawn and shift, and it means that we have all these great blue wave members of Congress that we picked up that are then running in tougher, redder, more conservative districts. Um, so the focus of our work was really to begin to build up our organizing muscle throughout the state with a focus on battleground counties uh, not just for 2020, but for 2022 as well. Um, so we identified 12, quote, battleground counties. Uh, we have 14 offices in those battleground counties with about 23 staff that are focused on building the infrastructure, working with the Assembly, the Senate, our congressional members, our county committees, our clubs, our resistance groups. Uh, labor and, and others to maximize our capacity and to increase our ability uh, to be to be successful up and down the, the ballot. And the second is, is is every other county, which has been identified as a blue wave county, uh, and we'll be getting and we have area six area directors across the state that are actually working with those counties that are that don't fall into the battleground county, uh, county category. Uh, but to provide them with training, uh, logistical support, uh, data support, 
and specifically to give them the tech technological tools that can actually make your job a little bit a little bit easier. Uh, you know, we are in a union hall, and I come from a labor background, and so my own view is always how much of your membership can you mobilize on a single day around a single issue. And my view is if you can't mobilize 1% of your membership on a single day around a single issue, then you're not really organized. So if we have 9 million members in California, that means can I turn out 90,000 people on a single day around a single issue? And today, I don't believe we can do that. So we got some serious work to do in, in strengthening our organizing muscles throughout, uh, throughout the party. I also think the work is particularly important for uh, one of the central issues that came up in the, in the room when you uh, spoke about what you were going to do in order to make 2020 successful. And that is this question of, of unity, right? I think if you were to make a prediction nine months ago, you would have said we're going to end up with two candidates, um, and you would have been right. If you'd have said that three weeks ago, you'd said that's crazy. We're not going to get down to two candidates. We're going to be in a mess for months. Well, here we are. We essentially have two candidates at uh, at this point. Um, and and I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of um, on both sides of folks who support um, uh, support Biden and support Sanders um, who are connected to their candidate for different reasons uh, and, and virtually all of them good reasons. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, going back to that, what I led off by saying, what are we all fighting for, right? What is our common purpose? Uh, I do believe that even those that are, um, you know, are Biden supporters or Sanders supporters ultimately know that once we get past July, we've got a bigger purpose in place. And the work that we are doing is bigger than one person. Whether it's Bernie Sanders, whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's anybody else, right? Uh, especially we're talking about the democracy, the future of democracy in our country. Uh, and so I know that there's a lot of you know, consternation in primary season about is everybody going to get on the same page? Uh, but I think the work uh, grounds us in being on the same page, right? Um, when we're online and you know, we're, we're in Facebook chat rooms and stuff, sometimes we like to lose ourselves as <laughs> to sort of the, what the reality of the world that we're, we're facing at this particular moment. So I have more faith in us uh, than, uh, than maybe some or most give us. I think we're more durable. I think we are going to come together and I think we are going to be uh, successful in removing Donald Trump from the, from the White House. So clean it up, turn to the work, and now find a way to pay for it. Um, let's just skip to the questions and forget how to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to pass the hat here. Don't, don't be concerned. Um, we might. We might. Well, I would say that the, uh, the state party has long been a financial vehicle to elect Democrats up and down the ballot. In particular, the Assembly, the Senate, and our members of Congress. County committees have really taken leadership on the, on the local level. Um, so the party has, in some ways, operated like a, in the election code, as sort of a financial vehicle for that activity. Uh, the problem is, is that we're not financially structured to have the conversation with 9 million Democrats that are required to harness that power to actually see a real change. That's the reason why you have what's called state dollars and then you have federal dollars. State dollars you can take in unlimited amounts. You can take them from unions, you can take them from uh, corporations, you can take them from individuals in unlimited amounts. Federal money is capped. For the party, it's $10,000. Is, is the limit on what you can take in federal money from any uh, PAC or individual, whether it's a union of 200,000 members or one individual, 10,000 is the limit to the party. In election season, 
in order to have the conversation with voters about turning out to vote, whether it's for a state candidate, a local candidate, a federal candidate, the presidential election, if there's a federal campaign going on, it has to be federal money, right? So we get plenty of state money for our ongoing operations, but have virtually no federal money. So we're set up to be a financial vehicle, but not set up to have the real conversation that we actually need to have to do that power building I talked about. So what it requires us to do is, over the next three to five years, transition away from being 80% on the state side, to my view being about two thirds on the federal side. In order to do that, we've got to have a real infrastructure in the state, so we've expanded our fundraising team from two people to, to seven people around the state, helping us focus on high net worth individuals. Um, and the second is to expand our small dollar donor program. Uh, obviously the, the Sanders campaign has really led on this, but many other candidates have come along with the small dollar donor program, primarily because the DNC forced them to do it in order to get on the state stage. Um, I guess unless you're Mike Bloomberg, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but I, it requires us to have an online presence. Uh, we're going to focus on a, a phone program. We're going to focus on a mail program as well. And we're going to ask the leaders in our party to step up and commit to bringing in small dollar donors into the program. So, and, and we think, well, what does $5 a month really do? If we have 9 million members, if I get 100,000 of them, to give us five dollars a month. That doesn't seem like a lot, but that's six million dollars. Six million dollars plays for a baseline field program around the state. So we want a hundred thousand people to give us five dollars a month to pay for 15 offices and 25 staff to do this grassroots building that is required around the, around the state. Uh, I believe if we continue to grow our budget year over year and diversify, we'll be able to do the kind of work that we ultimately want to do. Um, so that's really been my work for the past uh, nine months. There's obviously a lot of pieces that are a part of that, that are traveling around the state and listening to, to folks like yourself as to what's happening on the, on the ground. So I appreciate the time. I'll stop there and answer any easy questions that you may have. Well, <laughs>
so they pretty much uh, had the old fashioned plan, right? Yeah. Um, so part of my, it's good to report that. I think most of us that worked on the campaigns in 2018 didn't really realize what the outcome was locally. And several people talked today about the importance of down ballot races. That's a big part of what we focus on, is down ballot party races. So what we're going to have to develop is part of our capacity is to be able to pretty much, uh, I will say, eliminate the Republican Party in terms of um, their ability to mount uh, campaigns that elect Republicans to local office. Um, but we also, since 2008, and I think we started to collect numbers, uh, we've done phone calls on behalf of Barack Obama, on behalf of Hillary Clinton, and I just have to remember, Vince Kohler's uh, past year of our committee would certainly remember these numbers. I think they were in the 15 to 20,000 range, but Caesar reminded me this morning that he thinks they were much, much more than that in 2008. So our, yeah. our capacity, if that's our standard, <laughs> was, was how, how much we were able to accomplish phoning outside of our area and still endorse local candidates and get them elected. So we sort of have a two-prong, um, two sets of goals. One is to elect local Democrats. One is to elect Democrats outside of our county, and then figure out a way to make it. Sort of the same thing, except we're one percent of what you're in charge. So that's I'm going to have these numbers here. And we'll keep numbers as we go. Now, what's left out of here is actually what Swing Left has done, and what uh, Labor has done. This, this is just a central committee, and. Uh, so we did well in 2018. Uh, so our goal is to build our capacity and be able to do two things at one time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. I'll take one of those to write on, please. Um, so uh, our guest has been very generous with his time. Rusty and his staff person, Michelle, do need to leave here promptly at 1.30. So uh, we all have many questions. So we're gonna, he's going to take questions right now. And we're going to stop taking questions or wrap up uh, when he feels right, probably about a quarter after, maybe 20, it'll be up to him. And uh, then we're going to close that down, have a little social time. Uh, you'll still be able to have one-on-one -on -one at that point. So I'm going to ask you if you have a question to raise your hand. And we'll do what's called stacking them. That way it gives us an idea of how many folks you can add to it later. But right now, how many folks uh, believe they have questions? And I saw Sandra first, and then I saw Jan, and then I saw Dominic, and then I saw David, and I see Wes. And again, people can um, add on later, but this will give our guests a chance to know what he's up against here. And I also want to name when, when uh, Gary held up those statistics about how many women, how many people of color we had uh, running for office successfully in Monterey County. I want to hold up that today is Women's Day. And also yesterday was 55 years ago, the March in Selma and the fight for voting rights. And we know what's going on in our nation. And yes. thankfully, California, uh, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful to be in California yes. and ahead on yes. all these issues. So uh, go for it, Sandra. Hi, so um, being a nurse, of course, I'm um, concerned about uh, coronavirus and stuff and how it relates to how we do our business as in politics. And I know that we have conventions and there's a talk about maybe for those that do not be, do not want to be exposed, and um, what are the plans to make it inclusive for them to participate um, virtually? Um, if there's any plans for future, um, uh, anything like that for the future. And the number two reason why I'm asking is because when I went to San Francisco to the convention, I saw a lot of people with disabilities that were really struggling to stand in line, to vote, you know, for you, for whoever, and I thought, there's got to be a better way to accommodate them um, and still being inclusive if they cannot, you know, because it's a lot for them to be able to travel to long distances. So if there's, are there any plans for virtual participation when we have democratic meetings? Thanks for the question. I would say first, San Francisco is a horrible location to have a convention. Um, just because um, 
it, it wasn't set up to accommodate 5,000 people, and frankly, the voting system that was, was in place. Um, so I, I certainly acknowledge the challenges uh, that there were with that, that venue. Uh, we have an executive board coming up uh, March the 20th to the 22nd, so two weeks from now. Uh, I put out an email on Friday that essentially said, we are, you know, the safety of our delegates and participants is our number one priority. Uh, we're, we're, the meeting is currently scheduled to go forward. Uh, we are, however, continuing to monitor uh, the situation and certainly reserve the right to do what is the, in the best interest of, of all the delegates. Um, we are going to look for ways in which we can uh, allow for the participation of those that are either over the age of 50 or 60 or have an impacted immune system uh, or the doctor simply says you shouldn't go um, and there's really one primary piece of business at the executive board which is the DNC election uh, so we're going to find a way to try to accommodate that but we're in a probably a three to five day sort of window of a decision as to whether or how that meeting proceeds. And then post that uh, meeting, uh, whether it takes place or not, is really thinking about this not as a momentary deal, but a potentially longer term kind of a situation, especially once we get past the summer months and get into the winter months when you, know, you could see this come back in a much different, uh, different way. Um, so we're, we're thinking about what we can do virtually, we're thinking about what we can do by mail. The bylaws do not allow for um, any by mail or virtual voting. Um, it's my view, and I'm going to make the decision based upon what's in the best interest of delegates, setting aside what the bylaws say. If we're talking about the health of you know, participants, then we'll worry about the bylaws later. I'm going to make sure that people are, are safe. Um, so, I don't have a full, this is the, the, of what we're doing, but we're continuing to monitor and make a decision based upon the circumstances, you know, Kevin Newsom's now declared a state of emergency, you've got cases in the Central Valley, which is where we're going, we're talking about bringing 500 people from around the state to a central location, so obviously, at the very least, if we have any, there's going to be a heightened level of precautions, you know, we're, we're I walked in and shook a couple of people's hands. We probably won't do that. And I will ask people not to shake hands. Um, maybe we will hand out hand sanitizer to everyone. We will, you know, I think there's things that we can do uh, to keep everyone safe. Thank you for the point. Janet. Uh, you know, there's some of us who believe in healthcare for all, you know, and for a pathway to citizenship for immigration. And those of us who are in a category we're being of mind to just donate to candidates because the party is not with us yet. Do you have anything to say to that? I guess, do you feel the party is actually with these people? The, the Democratic Party is broad enough to include those people? Or do you think that the others are such a large number you could just count on their money and exclude those people who want to have fair citizenship well, and help you for all? Sure. Well, one, I would say, uh, I believe that we are all on the same page uh, as to health care for all. Uh, the party is on record in its platform of a single-payer system um, for providing health care to all individuals in this country. Um, there's certainly a uh, point of debate about how fast to get there and what is the process by which you get there. Um, but the vast majority of people in this state don't really care about our petty differences about process. They're sick, they want to see a doctor. And it's our responsibility to help them do that. Um, so while we are fighting for a universal single-payer system, if we have the opportunity to cover undocumented adults under the current system, we should do that. If we have the opportunity to give um, uh, you know, folks who are 45 minutes away from emergency care in a rural part of the state, we should do that. Um, while we're you know, 
debating and talking about uh, the system that we ultimately ultimately transition to. So the party is on record with that. I believe the party has supported that. With regards to you know pathway to citizenship for the you know uh, 11 million undocumented workers and families in this country, the party has been on record in supporting it. You know uh, uh, an immigration system that moves them on a path to citizenship. In fact, we. Um, initiated in our bylaws a, uh, a provision that would allow those that are uh, do not have the ability to register to vote, <coughs> maybe they're not a citizen or they're on probation or parole, the opportunity to pledge to be a Democrat and to be a delegate to the state part. That would actually be fine with finalized in, in my sale. Um, so I, you know, I'm sorry if the actions of the party make you feel that it's not on board with what you're uh, referring to, but I think the party is there. Um, certainly, folks who disagree about how to get there, but there's universal agreement uh, that in fact we should get there. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah, I was really stoked somewhat that the, the primary that moved up in California so more than 18 of the cycles of presidential elections. But it's still somewhat awkward because obviously, with our primary in March, <laughs> my mail hands in February. In November and December is such an awkward month mm -hmm. to really get things going of yeah. course what's happening in prior. Is there talk at the, the state chair level with other state chairs? Hey, I, I know you talk about New Hampshire always want to be heard. New Hampshire and uh, Iowa always want to be first. But is there talk about trying to push things back a bit so yeah we can be more effective, people aren't walking in the dead of winter. You know, ours are being pushed back collectively, so if we get that extra hour uh, of sunlight, someone, or is it just kind of states are competing uh, to where it gets to go first? You know, is there ever like a collective conversation among state chairs? Hey, if we move it back a little bit, maybe we could organize a little bit better. Well, I would Hampshire have been first for forever. And I think that they have. Iowa certainly has blown the idea of a caucus, and I think they potentially blown the idea of actually being first. Uh, <laughs> they basically killed a four billion dollar tourist boom to the state to, with the debacle that there, there was. Um, I'm not, you know, the primary has moved around so so many times. It was in June, it was in March, it was June. It was, you know, it's all over the place. I think it did have an impact of actually putting California on the map. I think there were really two two reasons why. One is the early three reasons. One was the early date, so people were showing up in a way in which they they weren't before. Two was 494 delegates that are at stake and a proportional um, breakdown that allows everybody to do something or the potential to do that. And then third is the big field. You know, uh, if we had had two candidates, I don't think you would have gotten. Uh, those two candidates into the far flung reaches of the, of the state. Um, but you have candidates going to Stockton and Modesto and Fresno and Reading and San Bernardino and Riverside. I mean, that's never happened. You know? And so it gives folks that aren't in LA and aren't in San Francisco the opportunity to see a presidential candidate up close and almost have the Iowa experience. New Hampshire experience that they've never had before. So I know that there's challenges of, you know, we have to walk, walk in the dead of a California winter, which is like. February <laughs> 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 wasn't bad. Somewhere. Yeah, it was two to three outside at yeah. home <laughs> at Christmas. Um, so I, I, I think there's, um, there may be some conversations about moving it around. There's no collaboration with state chair teams. State chairs are kind of competing against each other um, for, for that attention. David. Uh, yes. Hi. I, I work at a uh, polling place in Soledad in the election, you know, just to you know, help people get vote and everything. Um, our, our election that was fine. I mean, we, we didn't have a problem with you know, uh, people wait long lines waiting. But I was concerned seeing on the news. Places like LA and stuff, these, these, these giant centers that were, that people were waiting five or six hours, seven hours, and I'm just super worried about when it comes to November time, especially the down ballot counties, that people may get you know, frustrated 
not love. Is there anything that the party is doing to perhaps help with the, the process? Well, you know, there's a reason why I, I'm glad that we don't have a caucus system in the registrar and the Secretary of State on our elections in our, in our primary. Uh, I would not want to be the head of the Iowa Democratic Party who resigned three days afterwards, or four days afterwards because she couldn't stick around. Um, so there are 15 counties that have, uh, you know, have transitioned to this vote center model, regional vote center model. Everybody wanted LA to go. When I was at the LA Fed, I actually fought against this. Um, because they went from 2,400 polling places down to about 1,200 on election day. And, um, you know, the ratios, they wanted 30,000 voters to one regional vote center. And I managed to get it down to 7,500. So it was significantly better, but certainly not as good as it really should have been. And because of cost, primarily, LA got out of, got a delay in the requirement of sending everyone a ballot. So there was a new system that was put in place, a regional vote center model, but they forgot, or they didn't forget, they didn't include the third piece, which is everybody gets a ballot. Um, they were delayed four years. The Secretary of State's office has called for everybody to get a ballot. I've publicly supported that. Um, you know, and I don't really care about your cost issues and logistical issues, you can figure it out. Um, because <clears throat> It was uneven, you know, uh, and so I, that is a form of, you know, can be construed as a form of voter suppression. Uh, California has has a track record of bending over backwards to make it easier to vote, uh, and I think over the next six months is committed to figuring it out in a way that uh, maybe doesn't fix everything, but when it's you know 65 percent, 70 percent turnout in the most important election of our lifetime. People don't have to wait seven hours in line to, to vote. Right. But I did say to people on that day, uh, there were a lot of people who stood in line for you to have the opportunity to stand in line to vote. Uh, and so if you're in line, don't move. <laughs> yeah. Stay there uh, because you need to, you know, cast the ballot. So we're working with the registrars and, and the Secretary of State. To well, it it seems the error of the way. Well, there's a lot of point, finger pointing going on. Everybody's trying to blame everybody. I, I think one of the reasons many people were used to going to the same polling place when that was a little bit, you weren't exactly where they go. So. And, and yeah. the future is regional vote centers. The past is polling places. And, um, but we have to, we have to be, be careful in that transition to make and sure we focus that. Exactly. And the last one, Wes. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, I guess, um, Homeless doesn't really make too much of a, um, a platform, but I'd like to know, has the, has the Democrat Party made a position on the right to shelter state that uh, Newsom wants to do? Um, and then what, is there anything the Democratic Party could do to um, bolster statewide distribution of dumpsters, porta potties, laundry, shower, service, that kind of stuff, make a position on it at least? <laughs> I can tell you like to be on camera. So. <laughs> Do it together. Um, so I would say that from a legislative standpoint and from the governor's office, they have taken a leadership role in not only addressing the, the services that are needed for a uh, homeless population, but also uh, making sure that we begin to address uh, or trying to address an affordability, housing affordability crisis. Uh, because you know you have you know tens of thousands of people on the street today, and you probably got hundreds of thousands of people that are on the verge of being on the on the street. Um, and so you know I think the party has I don't believe that the party has taken an official position on his his latest um, uh, you know uh, policy ideas. Uh, it certainly has in, in our platform provision that support. Um, Focusing and addressing homelessness in a way in which we have not been able to do, you know, and say um, a problem that, that Democrats in the state, as Newsom said, it, we, you know, it, it's in some ways our, our responsibility as being in the leadership of the state to tackle that issue. You know, I think he is 
uh, trying in various parts of the state. I know the legislature's put uh, they put 1.5 billion towards affordable housing. They put nearly a billion dollars last year towards um, uh, uh, homeless housing and, and homeless services. Um, and we will continue to do that. So. Okay. Um, so it's 115, and I know you have to grow at 130. Is there? Can we ask if there's one last question? One last question. Someone who didn't get a chance. Okay, two. That will and that'll do it. This is, I will say this is the most structured conversation that I've had. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a free wheel and just like answering questions as I'm like walking out of the way. You want to value your time. I'm grateful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's just the point that you were talking about how you're going to pay for the state level and Lena has to worry about how to pay for things you're local. I personally don't know what your funds go for compared to what Elena's go to for. So it's whenever you get to doing that appeal, I'd like to say just to make sure that you can point people to say, if you give money to the state, then this is what we use it for. Let mm me -hmm. just, just give you a, uh, you want to turn that off for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Our, um, we have our ongoing operations of the party. We have our uh, executive boards and conventions. Uh, and then we have our statewide field program. Um, so obviously when you're making an appeal to someone, you're going to be very specific about what that means. I'm asking for $10,000. Here's what $10,000 buys uh, in, in this program. Uh, and from an individual standpoint, I'm asking you to get $5 a month. That's going to allow us to make uh, 100 voter phone calls a month um, in these three counties. Um, so, we, in our fundraising strategy, it is very specific and, and sort of stratified as to what makes most sense. I mean, I, I just know a lot of people say, you know, you also get things from the national, you know, national, all those things, and, and people say, I'd just rather give to candidates, which is the way most people think, so of course. if you want to go from what the party's going to collect. Sure. You know. Chris, do you have a fund, was it uh, Dem 2020, mm -hmm. but do we donate to the state? Yeah, we have a... Uh, 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 called the DEN 2020 yeah. Donate Every Month yes. program. Um, we're also initiating what's called the Trail Raiser program, which is asking leaders within the party to commit to raising anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000. For some people, going to be, here's a $10,000 check, but go away. <laughs> so that's great. We're glad to take that. For other people, it will be, I'm going to write a commitment of $50 a month and I'm going to get 10 friends to do the same. Okay. So we'll continue to do that. Okay. And Fran, uh, Fran, that was and my, I was and that's it. We didn't really touch upon strategies for fundraising, and I was sort of, that was my question as well. But, you know, I think that the Republicans are much more aggressive about the finances, and I think we really need fundraising. Yeah. I, I, I can see where we're going to be limited we don't really have that happen. Absolutely. Okay, absolute last question. Yes. Maria. Yes, I was just going to ask you, uh, I, I was watching the debates uh, that went on starting from the beginning mm -hmm. to the end, and uh, there was a lot of people, a lot of the candidates would drop out because they didn't have enough uh, delegates, you know, so they drop out and they uh, continue on, uh, this, uh, you know, like, okay, maybe you decide what you want, but then I noticed that Amy and Peter uh, endorse the candidate they want. I wanted to know, is there a specific uh, kind of rule that, they, uh, that I believe that should be put where they don't endorse who they want, let the people decide who they want? Isn't there such a rule that should be put on where they don't actually go out and, and endorse people so that the other voters can vote for their, for their own purposes? Well, no. no. Aren't they entitled? There is no such rule. And no. aren't they entitled to support who they want to support? Yeah, yeah but uh, I was saying because uh, uh, what happens, a lot of voters, they go on and listen to what they say, because it's their supporters, you know. I just don't find it fair. You know, there should be some kind of rule where they should just go on. Okay, so they drop off because they had enough uh, delegates, and so they just let the people vote. So, one, well, they can be convincing <coughs> to, to voters, whereas voters don't really yeah. don't know who they're voting for. They just follow like uh, follow the leader, and that's why they're going to vote. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's fair. 
I just don't quite care. I understand. Mm -hmm. But it's it is a case where um, you know they they have run a campaign, uh, they have convinced people to support them, and then they personally are making an endorsement yes. of one candidate or for the other. This is in many ways the what happens in the consolidation of the of the field. Yes. Um, and so you know it, it's uh, I can understand how it can be uh, frustrating. Like why would you get involved in this? Um, but it, it is their right to make an endorsement. There's no rule that says you can't make an endorsement and can't support it. So, you know, I mean, in my, uh, the last thing I'll say in my case, I made it very clear from the very, very beginning of this uh, even uh, campaign for chair that I wouldn't be involved in the presidential primary, that I wouldn't engage or endorse a candidate prior to the party choosing its nominee in July. And I had to fight to stay in that position. <laughs> 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 and that's what you're doing as leaders. You're doing that to as leaders to support yeah, that. Yeah. In my view, one, nobody cares what I think about some candidate. I don't have to be following the people that are going to go to one candidate or the other. So I think it's important to be able for us to be on the same page behind whoever that number is. So I, I can appreciate the frustration. But often there's no rules. So we want to thank Rusty for... Yeah.